The Fierce 44, Black Americans Who Shook Up the World, written by the staff of The Undefeated, portraits by Robert Bowl, forward by Henry Louis Gates Jr. Robert Abbott, founder of the Chicago Defender, 1870 to 1940. In 1905, Robert Abbott started the Chicago Defender, one of the most important black newspapers in history with just 25 cents, the equivalent of about $7 today. What began as a weekly four page pamphlet distributed in the city's black neighborhoods quickly grew into a national publication with a readership of more than half a million. The success of the Defender made Abbott, the son of former slaves, into one of the nation's most prominent black millionaires and paved the way for other successful black publishers. At the Defender, Abbott encouraged the Great Migration in which six million African Americans fled the poverty and racially motivated violence of the South for new lives in the West, Northeast and Midwest. Many of them settled in Chicago where manufacturing jobs were opening up as World War I approached. Abbott was a natural hustler, which helped his reputation and the paper circulation. When the Defender was initially banned by white authorities in the South, because it encouraged African Americans to abandon the area and head north. Abbott, who was born in Georgia, used a network of black railroad porters to surreptitiously distribute the paper in southern states. His legacy lives on today in black, black publications such as Essence and Black Enterprise because he gave a voice to the voiceless Robert Abbott. Alvin Ailey, founder of Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, 1931 to 1989. Born into poverty in Texas, choreographer Alvin Ailey drew on his knowledge of close-knit black churches, rural juke joints, fiery protest songs, his lonely childhood and his adult life as a closeted gay man to fuel his passion for dance. The modern dance pioneer and civil rights artist as activist created pieces that have become as important to the definition of American art as tap dance, jazz and hip hop. His desire to have classically trained black dancers move to the music of Duke Ellington, gospel, blues, and Latin and African pop was revolutionary. Ailey explored issues of social justice, racism, and spirituality in the African American experience through his art. After a few years of dancing on Broadway, he started his own company in 1958 at the height of the civil rights movement. By 1965, Ailey had stopped performing as a dancer to concentrate on his company and choreographing dances for other performers. He created 79 ballets over the course of his career. Revelations, which premiered in 1960, is Ailey's most celebrated work. The Up From Slavery Dance narrative finds beauty in the midst of tragedy and pain, celebrates Black folks, resilience and humanity, and allows hope to overcome tribulation. Even after Ailey's death from an AIDS-related illness in 1989, the company and school have continued to be 
the premier spot for emerging black choreographers. The Alvin Ailey Dance, the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater is still one of the most popular dance companies touring internationally and has performed in dozens of countries on six of the seven continents. And as the picture says, because he brought the beauty of black bodies to the fight for justice. Alvin Ailey. Muhammad Ali, boxer, activist, 1942 to 2016. Muhammad Ali, who loudly proclaimed himself both pretty and the greatest boxer of all time, set the standard for social activism by athletes. He was named Cassius Clay when he was born in Louisville, Kentucky, and he started boxing at the age of 12 after someone stole his bike. At 18, Clay had won an Olympic gold medal. A short four years later, he beat the heavily favored Sonny Liston to become the world heavyweight champion. The next day, Clay showed the world that he was more than a great boxer, announcing that he was joining the Nation of Islam and getting rid of his slave name. He would now be known as Muhammad Ali. At the time, black athletes were expected to be credits to the race by being modest and dignified and staying quiet about issues affecting the country. Ali rejected all of that. He was nicknamed the Louisville Lip, mocking opponents and often forecasting his victory in rhyme. He became a Muslim in a predominantly Christian country. And at a time when fighting for civil rights meant pushing for integration, Ali joined a religious group that preached racial separation. Ali also questioned America's participation in the Vietnam War and refused to be drafted into the army. He was stripped of his boxing titles and put on trial for evading the draft. Ali eventually won his case after appealing it all the way to the su Supreme Court. But for more than three years, no one would pay him to fight. After his trial, Ali went on to win the world heavyweight title for an unprecedented third time in a bout against undefeated heavyweight champion, George Foreman, in the Rumble in the Jungle in Kinshasa Zaire. Ali, at age 32, was the underdog, but with an eighth round knockout, he reclaimed the title that has been taken from him years earlier because of his opposition to the war. A lifelong social activist and philanthropist, Ali received many honors for his humanitarian work including the Presidential Medal of Freedom. This is Richard Allen, because God doesn't segregate, but humans do. Richard Allen, founder of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, 1716 to 1831. He was born in slavery in 1960 in Philadelphia. Negro Richard struck a deal in 1780 to buy his freedom and that of his brother a few years later. Richard Allen, the name he chose as a freed man, discovered religion after hearing a Methodist preacher at a secret gathering of slaves in Delaware. But white Methodists didn't want to pray with blacks. So Allen, his wife, Sarah, and others started a Bethel Ami church on July 29, 1794, in a converted blacksmith shop in Philadelphia. Allen was the church's pastor. It was the beginning of the country's first independent black denomination, which now has more than 6,000 churches with about 3 million members. Recognizing that former slaves and freedom needed education, Allen opened a day school for black children and a night school for adults as well as creating church groups to care for the poor. Many of his sermons and, pub and published articles attacked slavery and criticized groups that wanted to send blacks back to Africa. Both Allen's family, home, and Bethel Ami were stops on the Underground Railroad, which gave shelter and aid to slaves escaping from southern borders. 
southern border states. Maya Angelou, because she rose to greatness despite cruel hardships. Maya Angelou, writer-activist, 1928-2014. to 2014. Maya Angelou lived a life as remarkable as the poetry and prose she crafted. She experienced a traumatic childhood marked by sexual abuse and violence, and at one point stopped speaking for five years. During this time, she memorized poetry, rearranging cadences and reciting Shakespeare, Shakespearean sonnets in her head. With the help of a teacher, Angela was able to speak again. <clears throat> she used literature to help her recover from trauma, but she got pregnant at 16. She found work as San Francisco's first African-American female cable car conductor and took many different jobs to support her family. Later, she joined the Harlem Writers Guild and with the help of fellow author James Baldwin, went on to write, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. The first in what would become a seven-volume best-selling autobiographical series. Nearly a decade later, Angelo finished And Still I Rose, a poetry collection that remains one of her most important works. Her writing earned her many awards, including three Grammys and the Presidential Medal of freedom. Angelo was also a fearless civil rights activist, serving as a coordinator for Martin Luther King Jr.'s Southern Christian Leader Conference, known as SCLC, and working with Malcolm X to establish the organi Organization of Afro-American Unity. <clears throat> Life tried hard to break Angelo, but in the face of it all, she rose. Rebecca Kenyon from Forest Street School Elementary Library, here to read Ella Baker, Civil Rights Activist, 1903 to 1986. Ella Baker's grandmother, a former slave, used to tell her a story about being threatened with a whipping for refusing to marry a man her owner's wife had selected for her. The story helped fuel Baker's lifelong quest for justice for her people. She became one of the most important behind the scenes organizers for the civil rights movement. In the 1940s, Baker worked at the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, helping to convince black people that the United States could and should exist without discrimination based on race. In 1957, she moved to Atlanta to help Martin Luther King Jr. form the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, known as the SCLC. Organizing protest and running a voter registration campaign called the Crusade for Citizenship but Baker grew frustrated with the leadership style of the men at the top of the organization who didn't know how to deal with a strong woman. Inspired by four college students who refused to leave a lunch counter at Woolworths in Greensboro, North Carolina, after they were denied service, Baker helped create the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee on or known as NCC, pronounced SNCC. The group emphasized voting rights for African Americans and helped organize the Freedom Rides in which black and white students tried to desegregate bus terminals in the South. Baker's nickname was Fundy, which is Swahili for a person who teaches a craft to the next generation. Baker viewed young people as one of the strongest and most important aspects of the civil rights movement. As long as they had the audacity to dream of a better, equal, and brighter tomorrow, and were willing to work for it through peaceful protest, a fairer society awaited them. She truly lived up to the name Fundy.
James Baldwin. James Baldwin knew it was his job to reveal the truth, the truth about his race, the truth about his country, the ugly truths of racism, poverty, and inequality that plagued the United States even now. He confronted American racism with fearless honesty, and he did it with style. His brilliant prose combined with his own experience with the best and worth, worst of the black life around him. The joys, the blues, the sermons, the spirituals, and the bitter sting of discrimination. Baldwin grew up in Harlem, where his writing talent was recognized at an early age. He moved to Europe when he was 24 after becoming discouraged by the racism in the United States. His first no novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain, illuminated the struggle of inner city, uh, poor inner city residents. His collections of es essays called The Fire Next Time explosively represented black identity just as the country was coming to terms with how much white supremacy helped shape our history. In his second novel, Giovanni's Room, Baldwin wrote about homosexuality, exploring sexual identity without ever mentioning race. As an impoverished black, man, black gay man, Baldwin was asked if he felt he had bad luck. In fact, he said he believed he hit the jackpot. His identity helped create his work, and his writing represented every individual whose access to the American civil liberties was hampered by race, gender, sexuality, or poverty. Baldwin was unapolog unapologetically asked the nation to see its true self through the beauty of its most marginalized people. Jean Michel Basquiat, artist, 1960 to 1988. Eight short years, that's how long it took Jean Michel Basquiat to secure his legacy as a great artist. He died at the age of 27 from a drug overdose, leaving behind paintings, drawings, and notebooks, many of which explored American punk and hip hop the urban plight of African-Americans, jazz, and the nature of fame during the 1980s. Born to a Haitian father and Puerto Rican mother, Basquiat dropped out of high school and started doing graffiti art on New York City's Lower East Side. He was handsome, fashionable, and famously eccentric. The drawing in Basquiat's best-known pieces may look primitive, but the images are complex and sophisticated. While his worldview was undeniably black, urban, and hyper-masculine, his bold technique featuring splashes of paint was influenced by modern abstract masters Jackson Pollock and Cy Twombly. But there is also a connection to early 20th century African-American greats such as Romar Berdan and Jacob Lawrence. As influenced as Basquiat is, most of his work is privately owned and few museums have any of his best known pieces. His paintings attract stratospheric prices when they are put up for auction. In 2017, Basquiat's 1982 untitled painting sold for 110.5 million, a record high for any American painter, making him the most successful African American painter in history. Celebrities collect his work an entire generation of hip hop artists, Kanye West, Jay-Z, Lil Wayne, Killer Mike, Rick Ross, and J. Cole have name checked Basquiat. In other words, legendary dopeness and enigmatic brilliance never go out of style. Mary McLeod Beth Hune. Civil rights activist, educator, 1875 to 1955. Because she left us a legacy of love, hope, and dignity. Though she was able-bodied, Mary McLeod Bethune carried a cane because she said it gave her swank. An educator, civil rights leader, and advisor to four U.S. presidents, the first lady of the struggle has been synonymous with black uplift since the early 20th century. 
She turned her faith, her passion for racial progress, and her organizational and fundraising savvy into the enduring legacies of Bethune Cookman University and the National Council of Negro Women. Bethune, the 15th of 17 children, her parents, former slaves, grew up in rural South Carolina and started working in the fields as a young girl. She hoped to become a missionary in Africa after attending seminaries in North Carolina and Illinois, but was told black missionaries were unwelcome. So she turned to educating her people at home, founding the Daytona Literary and Industrial Training School for Negro Girls in 1904 with a dollar and 50 cents and a handful of students. The school later merged with Cookman Institute, a school for African-American boys. Beth Hune served as president, one of the few female college presidents in the nation at that time, and also became president of the National Association of Colored Women. A decade later, Beth Hune founded the influential National Council of Negro Women. Beth Hune helped organize black advisors to serve on the Federal Council of Negro Affairs, the storied black cabinet under President Franklin D. Roosevelt. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt considered Beth Hune one of her closest friends. Beth Hune worked to end poll taxes and lynching. She organized protests against businesses that refused to hire African Americans. Her entire life, her, she organized, she wrote, she lectured, and she inspired. Hello, everyone. The next person of the Fierce 44 that we are going to learn about is Simone Biles. She was a gymnast born in 1997, and she's still alive today. Simone Ariane Biles, born in Columbus, Ohio, and raised outside of Houston, Texas, was six when an impromptu field trip changed her life. She and her classmates were at a local gymnastics center where a coach noticed that Biles just couldn't stand still and was bouncing all over the mats. Biles' family signed her up for classes and her boundless energy, amazing physicality, and acrobatic bravery took flight. Biles, who stands four feet, eight inches tall, began competing internationally in 2013. Later that year, she became only the seventh American and the first African American to win the world all around gymnastics title. But she was just getting started. Biles is the first woman to win three consecutive world all around titles. And in the 2016 Rio de Janeiro Olympics, she won gold medals in the vault floor exercise, individual all-around, and team all-around competition. She invented two moves, one in the floor exercise and another in the vault, that are named after her. Her routines are so difficult that she almost fell off the balance beam and still won a bronze medal in Rio. Biles' accomplishments are even more remarkable because of her childhood. When her birth mother was unable to care for her, Biles and her siblings spent years in foster care before her grandfather and his wife adopted her and her little sister, Adria. Biles now advocates on behalf of foster children and says being part of a family helped her feel like she mattered. So did finding her passion for gymnastics. Her twisting high-flying precision moves, including ones that didn't exist before, she made them up, have led many gymnastics judges and fans to consider her the best athlete in the history of the sport. And that is Simone Biles. 
Because before, yes, we can, there was unbought and unbossed. Shirley Chisholm, politician, born in 1924 and died in 2005. Before President Obama's Yes We Can slogan, there was Shirley Chisholm's motto, unbought and unbossed. In 1972, 36 years before Obama was elected the first black president, Chisholm was the first black candidate for a major party's nomination for president. That campaign made her a pathbreaker for women too. She was the first woman to run for the Democratic Party's presidential nomination, 44 years before Hillary Clinton became the first woman to win a major party's nomination for president. Being the first wasn't anything new for Chisholm. In 1968, she became the first black woman elected to Congress, representing New York, for seven terms from 1969 to 1983. As both a New York state legislator and a congresswoman, Chisholm fought for the federal government to help people get an education and to help poor people get food to eat. Chisholm noted that she faced more discrimination because of her gender than race during her legislative career, while acknowledging the additional struggle that Black women encounter because of their color. Every person Chisholm hired for her congressional office was a woman, and half of them were Black. Chisholm wanted women, African Americans, and the poor to get a seat at the table. And if there wasn't an empty chair, she advised bringing your own. Benjamin O. Davis Sr. Benjamin Oliver Davis Sr. began his military career in the Spanish-American War as a volunteer, volunteer in the infantry. It is thought that he have even lied about his age so he could enlist without his parents' permission. He liked the discipline and order, so in a few months after he was discharged, he re-enlisted and stayed in the military for the rest of his career. Four decades later, as the United States prepared to enter World War II, Davis became the first African American general in the Army. Americans' military was segregated for most of Davis's career, and black soldiers had limited options for promotions. His duty assignments were designed to avoid putting him in command of white troops or, or officers. Davis led troops in Liberia and the Philippines, where he served with an, uh, the famed all-black Buffalo soldiers. He was assigned as a professor of military science and tactics at both Wilberforce University in Ohio and the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. He rose slowly through the ranks, becoming the first black colonel in the army in 1930. In 1940, Davis was promoted to brigade general, general by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. During World War II, Davis headed a special unit charged with safeguarding the status and morale of black soldiers in the army, and he served in Europe as a special advisor on race relations. Davis retired in 1948 after 50 years of service. Six days later, President Harry S. Truman ordered the end of the discriminatory practices in the armed forces. Davis' determined and disciplines rise in the army paved the way for black men and women, including his son, Benjamin O. Davis Jr., who in 1954 became the second Af African-American general in the U.S. military, and the first in the Air Force. Frederick Douglass, abolitionist, author, 1818 to 1895. Born on a Maryland farm in 1818, Frederick Douglass was the son of a slave mother and a white father who may have been his owner. 
When Douglas was eight, he was sent to Baltimore to work for a ship carpenter. The carpenter's wife started to teach him to read, and Douglas recognized there was a connection between knowledge and freedom. At 15, Douglas was sent to a different farm to work for a brutal man with a reputation as a slave breaker. Douglas hated the man and his time on the farm and tried to escape. Eventually, Douglas was sent back to Baltimore where he worked as a slave in a shipyard. Eventually, Douglas was sent back to Baltimore where he worked as a slave in a shipyard. When he turned 20, he met a free black woman who helped him escape. She brought him a train ticket to New York, and, disguised as a sailor, he was on his way to freedom. Once he was in the North, Douglas started to talk to anti-slavery groups about his personal experience. He was a dynamic speaker who knew how to hold an audience. He was tall and graceful and had a voice that made you pay attention to what he had to say. Some people doubted that such a good speaker could have been a slave. So in 1845, Douglas wrote an autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, with all the details of his upbringing, a vivid portrayal of physical brutality, mental torture, and the separation of family members. The memoirs brought the horrors of slavery into the light and became the most influential personal story of slavery in U.S. history. Besides fighting for abolition, Douglas was also an outspoken supporter for women's rights and continued to push for equality all his life. Number 14, Charles Drew, physician. 1904 to 1950 because he was a medical pioneer who saved millions of lives. As a young man, Charles Drew was an exceptional athlete, starring in football, baseball, basketball, and track and field at Dunbar High School in Washington, D.C. He was an All-American halfback and captain of the track team at Amherst College in Massachusetts. Because he couldn't afford medical school in the United States, Drew attended McGill University in Montreal, but later moved back to the United States to teach at Howard University's medical school. Drew went on to do research at Columbia University in New York, becoming the first African American to get a medical doctorate at the prestigious school. He became the world's leading authority on blood transfusions and storage. His research established procedures for how blood should be collected and refrigerated and how blood donors should be recruited and screened, as well as training methods for people who would collect and test blood. His research on plasma, the liquid portion of blood without cells, made it possible for blood to be banked for long periods of time. Drew's work was especially important as the United States prepared for World War II. As a medical director of the American Red Cross National Blood Donor Service, Drew led the collection of tens of thousands of pints of blood for U.S. troops. Some historians say Drew's work may have saved the world from Nazism since battlefield blood storage and transfusions didn't exist before then. When the U.S. military ruled that the blood of African Americans would be segregated and not used on white troops, even though blood has no racial characteristics, Drew was outraged and resigned from the Red Cross. He returned to Washington, D.C. as a professor at Howard University and head of surgery at Freedman's Hospital, where he trained many black physicians. Drew continued to work as a physician until his untimely death in a car crash. Charles Drew. W.E.B. Du Bois, sociologist, writer, activist, 1868 to 1963. William Edward Bogart Du Bois, the first African American to receive a PhD from Harvard University, was a brilliant scholar who changed how black people saw their place in the world. 
but he was also a political activist who helped start the NAACP crusade against lynching and tried to unite black people across the world. His most fam famous book, The Souls of Black Folk, was published in 1903 and introduced the idea of double consciousness in which blacks always have to think about how white people see them. Du Bois rejected the arguments of Booker T. Washington, the most influential leader of the time, who asked blacks to accept discrimination while trying to prove they were worthy of equal treatment through hard work. Instead, Du Bois believed blacks should actively fight discrimination and racism. Du Bois acted on his beliefs. He helped start the NAACP and was the founder and first editor of its crusading magazine, The Crisis. He criticized President Wilter Wilson for re-segregating the federal government and continually spoke up for justice. Du Bois ran for the U.S. Senate in New York, representing the American Labor Party, and became chair of the Peace Information Center, which sought to ban nuclear weapons around the world. At one point, Du Bois was arrested and charged with being an agent of the Soviet Union. He was found not guilty and later moved to Ghana, where he stayed until the end of his life. Duke Ellington, composer, band leader, 1899 to 1974. Edward Duke Ellington started playing piano as a seven-year-old, and by the time he was 17, he was working as a professional musician. A few years later, he moved to New York City and was soon a regular at the famous Cotton Club in Harlem, launching a career as one of the greatest American musicians of all time. Just as soul music and Motown provided the soundtrack for the 1960s civil rights movement, big band swing music furnished the score for the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s. While many famous band leaders were playing then, including Count Basie and Benny Goodman, Ellington was the best. A pianist and an orchestra leader, music seemed to pour from Ellington. He wrote more than 1,000 tunes, many of which are considered classics, including Don't Get Around Much Anymore and Satin Doll. His original songs ranked among the first examples of crossover pop. They captured the essence of the black experience, but were also irresistible to white audiences. Unlike other band leaders who wanted their musicians to meld their sounds together, Ellington was famous for writing music to highlight individual artists. He liked to feature people with unique styles and was constantly rewriting even his biggest hits. Ellington received many honors, including 11 Grammy Awards, 13 Grammy Hall of Fame nods, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and a Pulitzer Prize special citation, and was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. But Sir Duke's legacy is bigger than any award. Whenever swing or big band music is mentioned, Ellington's name leaps to mind as he is the embodiment of jazz. Because the Queen of Soul deserves respect. Aretha Franklin, singer-songwriter, 1942 to 20. Aretha Franklin, the daughter of popular Detroit Baptist minister C.L. Franklin, scored a number one hit with her remake of Otis Redding's Respect. The song became part of the soundtrack of the civil rights movement as well as an anthem for women's movement as women demanded to be taken as seriously as men. But Franklin was bigger than one track. She had started out as a teenager singing gospel music. Soon she branched out and over the years moved easily from jazz to rhythm to blues and pop. At the Grammy Awards in 1998, she stepped out at the last minute 
for a sick opera star and dazzled the audience with her performance. But Franklin always brought her roots in gospel to her songs, which is why she was nicknamed the Queen of Soul. Franklin was a big supporter of the civil rights movement, one time going on tour with other artists to help raise money for the cause. She sang at the memorial service for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was a friend of her father's. She also sang at the inauguration of the first black president, Barack Obama. In 1987, Franklin became the first female performer inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Over her six decade career, she had more than 100 singles on the Billboard charts and 17 of them were top 10 singles. She won 18 Grammys and sold more than 75 million albums. Franklin was a musician's musician. She could bang it out on the piano and sang opera as effortlessly as she sang gospel. Few can match her four octave range or sustain a note or a song quite the way Franklin did. All hail the Queen of Soul. Jimi Hendrix, musician, singer, songwriter, 1942 to 70. Jimi Hendrix couldn't read or write music, but Rolling Stone magazine named him the greatest guitar player ever. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame went even further, calling him the most gifted instrumentalist of all time. Hendrix left his home in Seattle in 1961 to become a paratrooper trooper in the Army. After suffering an injury from a parachute jump, he left the military and started working as a backup musician for some of the best rhythm and blues acts of the time. Soon Hendrix began his short career as a headliner, radically changing how the electric guitar was played and combining rock with blues and jazz. He was popular with white audiences, even while playing music built on the black experience. What made Hendrix so great? His live performances that could be messy and his guitar tone ear piercing, but it was these idiosyncrasies that made him unique. For Hendrix, music wasn't about a note-perfect performance, but a search for truth. He was a non-conformist and part of a generation that was proud to be anti-establishment. Hendrix died at only 27 after an overdose, but by then he had thoroughly changed how people thought about music. Hendrix's talent is probably best demonstrated by his performance of the Star Spangled Banner. At the famous Woodstock Music Festival in 1969, in which he used his guitar to condemn the war in Vietnam by evoking the sounds of artillery explosions and air raid sirens. Many guitarists have challenged Hendrix's position at the top, yet none have matched his genius. In the world of electric guitar, there are two ages the monochromatic era before Hendrix and the limitless kaleidoscopic period after Hendrix. Zora Neale Hurston, novelist writer, 1891 to 1960. Zora Neale Hurston is now recognized as one of the South's most famous and eloquent writers, but it took a long time for her talent to be recognized. She grew up in Eatonville, Florida, the first all-black incorporated town in the country, where her father was one of the first mayors. Her mother, a Sunday school teacher, who encouraged her children to be ambitious, died when Hurston was only 13. She didn't get along with her stepmother and eventually joined a group of traveling performers as a maid. She finally finished high school in her 20s before going on to get degrees from Howard University 
in Washington, D.C., and Bernard College in New York City, where she studied anthropology. In New York, Hurston became a central figure in the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s and pursued a career as a writer and researcher who studied the folklore of Southern Blacks. The author of four novels, including the now celebrated Their Eyes Were Watching God, and the autobiography Dust Tracks on a Road, she also wrote short stories, essays, and plays. Unlike other writers, Hurston focused on the experience of black women and wrote the way black people in the South actually spoke. Hurston never made much money from her writing. When she died, her neighbors in Fort Pierce, Florida, couldn't afford a headstone, so they buried her in an unmarked grave. Alice Walker, who later wrote The Color Purple, found her grave in 1972 and paid for a marker. Now everyone recognizes Hurston as an important author who told the story of country folk. Jesse Jackson, because he kept hope alive and made the White House a realistic goal. Jesse Jackson, civil rights activist, politician, 1941. Jesse Jackson's are the biggest shoulders that Barack Obama stands on. Jackson laid the foundation for electing a black president, one of the signature achievements of the 21st century. The groundwork began with Jackson's decision to run for presidency himself in 1984, widely seen then as more symbolic than practical. Black leaders had discussed for years what it would take to seriously compete for the highest office in the land. After Harold Washington was elected Chicago's first black mayor in 1983, and with concern mounting about the negative impact of Ronald Reagan's pre presidency on black Americans, some thought it was time. Jackson was one of the greatest political orators in American history. His ability to inspire farmers and factory workers, maids who take the bus, and teenagers growing up in housing projects was unmatched. In 1984, Jackson ran for president and won five Democratic primaries and caucuses on a tiny budget. With his second pre presidential campaign in 1988, he established himself as the leader of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. He won 11 primaries and caucuses and finished as runner-up to the Democratic nominee, Michael Dukakis. Before Jackson's campaign, black campaign workers were largely put in small roles focused on urban issues. Jackson helped increase black participation in all jobs and politics. The result was more field operative, strategists, and fundraisers, and candidates for a wider range of offices than ever before. He deserves credit for his civil rights activism in the Deep South and later on Wall Street and in Silicon Valley. But Jackson's most notable achievement was demonstrated that sending an African-American to the Oval Office was an attainable dream. Hi, today I will be reading about Jay-Z from the Fierce 44, Black Americans Who Shook Up the World because he's the greatest man in hip hop. Sean Corey Carter grew up in the Marcy Projects in Brooklyn, New York, where his mother, Gloria Carter, remembers he'd be in the kitchen of their apartment rapping until late at night. He never graduated from high school and initially sold CDs out of his car. He became Jay-Z with his 1996 debut album, Reasonable Doubt. 10 years later, MTV named him the greatest rapper of all time. Famous for his work ethic, 
Jay-Z has released 14 Billboard number one albums, the most by any solo artist in history. These include many timeless tracks that have defined popular culture, such as 2004's 99 Problems, a look at what it's like to drive while black in America, and 2009's DOA, Death of Autotune, which single-handedly undermined a voice correction tool that was widely used in rap and pop music. Jay-Z was instrumental in taking hip hop from its origins in house parties to selling out stadium concerts. As he climbed the charts, Jay-Z also became an influential businessman. He is an owner of Tidal, a streaming music service. He co-founded Rockefeller Records served as president of Def Jam Records, founded entertainment company Rock Nation, and became part owner of the Brooklyn Nets before giving up his stake in the NBA franchise to found his own sports agency, Rock Nation Sports. Married to Beyonce, Jay-Z has lived the American dream of reinvention and second chances. Hi everyone. Up next in the Fierce 44 is Katherine Johnson. She was a mathematician and a physicist born in 1918. By fourth grade, every American kid had studied the history of this country's space missions, especially the story of astronaut John Glenn, who became the first American to orbit the Earth in 1962. But for a long time, one nugget was missing from those histories, the Black woman who helped him get safely there and back. Katherine Johnson was a physicist and mathematician, one of the one of many black women hired by NASA in the early 1950s to work in the guidance and navigation department. She was a math prodigy who graduated from high school at 14 and earned a double degree in math and French from West Virginia State College at 18. And she helped to integrate the graduate school at West Virginia University where she was one of three black students and the only black woman. At NASA, Johnson was plucked from the pool of women working on math calculations to work with an all male flight research team. Besides her work on Glenn's famous flight, she helped launch the use of computers at the space agency and helped calculate the orbit for the 1969 Apollo 11 flight to the moon. Johnson co-authored 26 scientific papers in her career at NASA. In 2015, then President Barack Obama awarded Johnson the Presidential Freedom I'm sorry, the Presidential Medal of Freedom for her pioneering work and the next year her story was told in grand Hollywood fashion in the movie Hidden Figures. Taraji P. Henson played the role of Johnson and brought to life a story that many of us never knew existed. Quincy Jones, music producer, songwriter, activist. 1933 is when he is born. Many words can be used to describe Quincy Jones, but let's start with innovator. Others that work producer, writer, arranger, composer, and humanitarian. He has had an impact on music and popular culture for six decades, helping make some of the best-selling albums of all time. Jones is responsible for another first in music, movies, and television, and has paved the way for other African Americans in the entertainment industry. In 1967, Jones became the first black composer to be nominated for two Academy Awards within the same year. 
1971, he was the first black musical director and conductor for the Oscars show. And in 1995, Jones was the first black person to receive the Gene Herschelop Humanitarian Award from the Academy of Motion Picture, Arts and Sciences. Jones has earned 79 Grammy nominations and has collected 27 Grammys and was honored with the Grammy Legend Award in 1991. He produced all three of Michael Jackson's iconic albums, Off the Wall, Bad, and Thriller, the last which sold more than 33 million copies in the United States alone. In 1985, Jones sealed his reputation as a humanitarian by gathering more than three dozen of the biggest names in music in one studio to record the song, We Are the World. The song raised money for famine relief in Africa and is one of the highest selling singles of all time. Jones' influence extends across many media. In 1993, he founded Vibe Magazine, an entertainment publication that gave urban generation Xers a periodical that reflects themselves. Even now in his 80s, Jones isn't done. He's been working on a subscription service for vinyl records and collaborating on a brand new brand of headphones. Michael Jordan, because he may be the best player ever to touch a basketball. Michael Jordan, basketball player, NBA team owner, 1963. In 1978, Michael Jordan was a sophomore in high school and didn't get picked for the varsity basketball team. That setback helped create a ruthless competitor who went on to become one of the most dominant athletes in any sport. Jordan accepted a scholarship to the University of Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he played for three years. He scored the game-winning basket to clinch a national championship in his freshman year and swept all the National Player of the Year awards in his junior year. In the 1984 NBA draft, the Chicago Bulls selected him third overall. Jordan is regarded by many as the best player ever to touch a basketball. His six NBA titles in six NBA final appearances with six NBA final MVP awards are among the greatest feats ever seen in sports. He's won five league MVPs, 10 league scoring titles, an NBA Defense Player of the Year award, two NBA Slam Dunk Contest trophies, and the list goes on. He turned Air Jordan into a billion dollar brand for shoes, clothing, and accessories. Jordan left basketball at the peak of his playing career to play minor league baseball. When that didn't go well, he announced his return to the NBA with a two word fax that read, I'm back, and went on to win three more championships. After his playing days ended, Jordan became the majority owner of the Charlotte Hornets, the first former player to reach that level. And in 2016, in a rare public statement on social justice, he said he could no longer stay silent about the killings of African Americans and targeting of police officers, making a $2 million donation to help address the problem. Ruthless, relentless, and peerless. That's the Jordan way. Martin Luther King Jr., civil rights activist, Baptist minister, 1929 to 1968. In April 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. sat in a jail cell in Birmingham, Alabama. He had been arrested for leading marches and sit-ins to protest racial segregation and was troubled when a group of white ministers criticized the protests. King responded to them with the famous letter from a Birmingham jail. In this letter, originally written on scraps of paper, he described the racial and economic apartheid facing blacks in the United States. He tried to encourage the people who worried that the fight against segregation would never succeed. And he dismissed those who thought good behavior was more important than justice. A Baptist minister, King practiced nonviolent protest, but he was committed to radically changing how America treated its black citizens. Later that year, 
King helped organize the March on Washington, which brought 250,000 protesters to Washington, D.C., demanding equality for all Americans. Standing in front of the Lincoln Memorial, King delivered his I Have a Dream speech, one of the most famous addresses in American history, in which he talked about his hope that one day whites and blacks could join hands as equals. King was a man of incredible achievement. He was president of the SCLC, one of the most important groups in the civil rights movement. He helped lead the Montgomery bus boycott, which forced the city to integrate its buses. In 1964, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. In 1968, King went to Memphis to support a strike by sanitation workers and was shot to death by a sniper. After his assassination, a federal holiday was created in his honor. And like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln, there's a monument dedicated to King in Washington. Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks was an accidental pioneer of modern day medicine. She was 31 years old and had five children when she was diagnosed with cervical cancer. Just months before her death, doctors at John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore took pieces of tissue from her cancerous tumor without her consent. Lax was not a slave, but parts of her cancerous tumor represent the first isolated human cells ever bought and sold. Her cells, known among scientists as HeLa, were unusual in that they were, could rapidly reproduce and stay alive long enough to undergo multiple tests. Descendants of lax cells live in laboratories across the world and are worth billions of dollars. They played an important role, an uh, important part of developing the polio vaccines, cloning, gene mapping, and in vitro fertilization. The HeLa cell, line has been used to develop drugs for treating herpes, leukemia, influenza, and Parkinson's disease. The cells have been influential in the study of cancer, lactose digestion, sexually transmitted diseases, and appendicitis. While scientists knew her name for many years, her own family did not know how her cells were being used or that billions of dollars had been made because of those experiments. It wasn't until a writer named Rebecca Sklute started a book about Lax and the Hilo cell line that was uh, that the public learned what had happened and how little her husband and children knew about her legacy. Her cells are saving lives today, but no doctor can be proud of how Lax was treated. Number 27, Malcolm X. Civil rights activist, minister, 1925 to 1965, because he sought to ignite equality by any means necessary. Malcolm X was the American dream, whether America wanted him to be or not. He overcame drug addiction and a life of crime to become one of the country's foremost civil rights leaders and champion of black pride. Born Malcolm Little, he converted to Islam while serving a seven-year prison sentence for burglary. He changed his name to Malcolm X because Little was the name imposed on his father's family by white slave masters. Less than two years after his release from prison, he became a minister at Nation of Islam temples in Boston, Philadelphia, and New York. In 1957, Malcolm X founded the Nation of Islam newspaper, Muhammad Speaks. For a time in the 1960s, it was the most widely read black newspaper in the United States, and it enabled him to spread his revolutionary message of black pride. Malcolm X's theories became the blueprint for the black power movements of the 60s and 70s and he is also credited with the inspiring the idea that black is beautiful. Although he'd been known for segregationist views, 
and accepting violence in the quest for equality, Malcolm X took a more diplomatic stance after he left the Nation of Islam in 1964. He began to preach peaceful resistance and the benefits of integration. But that stage of his life was brief because he was assassinated by members of the nation the following year at the age of 39. The autobiography of Malcolm X, which was published after his death, became an immediate bestseller. It is essential reading for any American. Malcolm X. Thurgood Marshall, Supreme Court Justice, 1908 to 93. By the time Thurgood Marshall was nominated to be a Supreme Court Justice in 1967, few lawyers in history had argued and won more cases before the nation's highest court. Marshall had racked up 29 wins and just three losses, including his most famous victory, Brown v. Board of Education, the 1954 decision that forced public schools to desegregate. Marshall was arguably the most pivotal figure in the deconstruction of Jim Crow segregation and the most consequential lawyer of the 20th century. While other civil rights leaders organized vital sit-ins, marches, and boycotts, Marshall attacked inequality and racism in America's laws. As the NAACP's lead attorney, he traveled the South filling briefs in local courthouses, representing poor black defendants in criminal cases, and doing battle against racist white jurors and judges. Marshall traveled 50,000 miles a year, often alone and in some of the nation's most dangerous cities and towns. He stayed in homes of appreciative black folks who took elaborate steps to keep him safe and a step ahead of marauding Klansmen. He managed to maintain his strength amid daily death threats, sipping bourbon, and telling stories. He feared no one, including his colleagues on the Supreme Court, with whom he occasionally clashed during 24 years there, and was a tireless fighter for justice. It is fitting that Marshall was called Mr. Civil Rights. Across the South, when innocent men were jailed or families were forced to flee from homes destroyed by the Klan, people comforted themselves with two words, Thurgood's coming. Hey everyone, the next person of the Fierce 44 that we're going to learn about is Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison was a novelist who was born in 1931 and passed away in 2019, which wasn't too long ago. Toni Morrison, the daughter of a welder and a domestic worker, said her parents gave her a love of reading. She grew up to be one of the greatest writers in history and was the first African-American to win the Nobel Prize in Literature. Morrison taught English to college students for several years before moving to New York, where she worked as one of the few Black women at the upper levels of a book publishing company. She helped promote the work of Black writers and was one of the primary editors of The Black Book, a path-breaking 1974 collection of photos, songs, posters, and drawings that documented the joy and pain of the Africans brought to America and the generations that followed them. Morrison also wrote her own novels, which told the stories of African-American characters, especially women, struggling to find their way in a racist society. Her first novel, The Bluest Eye, was about a dark-skinned girl who thought her life would be better if she could have blue eyes. Her 1977 novel, Song of Solomon, became the first work by an African-American author in almost 40 years to be featured, to be a featured selection of the Book of the Month Club. Another novel, Beloved, won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction and was turned into a movie starring Oprah Winfrey. It is based on the true story of a runaway slave who, about to be recaptured, 
kills her infant daughter rather than have her live her life as a slave. In 2012, Morrison was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by Barack Obama. Barack Obama, 44th President of the United States of America. Barack Hussein Obama's stride into history has been as confident as it has been unlikely. He announced his candidacy for president on February 10th, 2007, as a first term U.S. Senator who previously had served just seven years in the Illinois Senate. He had little support from established politicians and many black voters did not even know who he was. But his campaign became a movement. His soaring speeches promising hope and change inspired millions. Less than two years later, a record crowd gathered on the National Mall to witness what was once unthinkable. Mm. The inauguration of the first black president of the United States. It was a singular achievement by a man with a singular history. Obama was born in Hawaii to a Kenyan father and a white mother. As a child, he lived in Indonesia before returning to Hawaii to be raised by his white grandparents. As a teenager, Obama began to discover his black identity largely through playing basketball. He admired and emulated the loose limbed swagger of the guys who played the game. He saw black as cool, and he embraced the virtues of blackness while managing to sidestep much of its complicated baggage. Through two terms as president, Obama saw economic growth, rescued the struggling auto industry, and enacted a historic health care reform law. Speaking to the nation in his farewell address, Obama used the slogan that accompanied his history-making rise to the White House, Yes, We Can. He said, Yes, We Did, Yes, We Can, because he was the President of the United States of America. Today, I salute to you, Barack Obama, the 44th President of the United States of America, born in 1961. Hi, I'm Ms. Osborne Booth, and today I'll be reading a passage about Jesse Owens from The Fierce 44, Black Americans Who Shook Up the World, because he was the athlete who humiliated Hitler, Jesse Owens. As a 21-year-old college student, James Cleveland Jesse Owens turned in what is probably the greatest day in sports history in less than an hour. Owens started his afternoon at the Big Ten Track and Field Championships in 1935 by tying the world record in the 100-yard dash. Ten minutes later, he set a world record in the long jump. Over the next half hour, he broke world records in the 220-yard dash and the 220 yard low hurdles. Remarkably, he had fallen down some stairs the, a few days before and badly hurt his back. The next year, Owens used his speed to beat racism. Heading into the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, Adolf Hitler, the German dictator, claimed that no dark skinned person could compete with the blonde haired, blue eyed Aryan master race. Owens almost didn't make it to Berlin because the United States had considered boycotting the Olympics over Hitler's treatment of Jews. But many African Americans opposed the boycott, yearning to prove their ability on a level playing field. Owens emerged as the biggest star of the Olympics, setting or equaling records in the 100 meter dash, the 200 meter sprint, 
the 400 meter relay, and the long jump. German crowds enthusiastically applauded his performances, deepening Hitler's humiliation. Owens returned home to the oppression of Jim Crow, pointing out that while he didn't shake hands with Hitler, he wasn't invited to shake hands with the American president either. Lacking a college degree, forced through back doors and to the backs of buses, Owens subsisted on low-paying jobs such as pumping gas and demeaning public appearances such as racing against a horse. Still, Owens' victories not only shattered the myth of white athletic superiority, but also established a black man as a hero for America and one of the greatest athletes of all time, Jesse Owens. Number 32, Gordon Parks, photographer, director, 1912 to 2006, because he brought us pictures of black America. Born in Fort Scott, Kansas, Gordon Parks bought his first camera at a pawn shop and taught himself how to use it. He made a name for himself while working at the Farm Security Administration a government agency that was fighting rural poverty. He went on to become the first African-American photographer on the staff of Life magazine and produced some of the best photo essays the world has ever seen, from showing what it meant to be black in America to telling the story of a 12-year-old in the slums of Rio de Janeiro he said that the camera was his weapon against racism and poverty. Park's work for Vogue in the 1950s changed the expectations of what an African-American photographer could be doing. He went to Paris, Cuba, and the streets of New York City, creating pictures that show the world of high fashion that few people of color had been able to reach. Parks was the first African-American director of major motion pictures, starting with The Learning Tree in 1969 and Shaft in 1971. These movies helped to increase the number of jobs for African-Americans in films, from actors in front of the camera to producers and directors behind it. Parks wrote nearly two dozen books on subjects ranging from poetry to photography. Parks' work transformed how later generations of black artists, photographers, and musicians saw themselves and the world, opening their imaginations to storytelling through pictures of the black experience. Gordon Parks. Sidney Poitier, because he ushered in the modern black leading man. Sidney Poitier, actor, filmmaker. In 1964, Sidney Poitier became the first African American to win an Academy Award for a leading role. In Lilies of the Field, he played a handyman who encounters a group of German, Austrian, and Hungarian nuns who believe that he's been heaven sent. Some may say the same about Poitier's career. Poitier challenged Americans to change their idea about what a movie star looked like. He starred in three important films in 1967 that centered on race and race relations. In To Serve With Love, he was a teacher dealing with racial and social issues at a school in London. In the Heat of the Night, he introduced a black detective who was investigating a murder in a small southern town. And Guess Who's Coming to Dinner addresses an interracial relationship in, in the same year that the Supreme Court overturned a Virginia, Virginia law that prohibited blacks and whites from marrying each other. Although he was born in Miami, Poitier grew up in his parents' native Bahamas. After a brief stint with the U.S. Army during World War II, he joined the influ influential Af 
American Negro Theater in Harlem and soon afterward started to appear in movies. Poitier understood the importance of having someone who looked like him step behind the camera too. He directed several important movies for black folks, including Uptown Saturday Night and Let's Do It Again, both of which he also starred in, and the comedy Stir Crazy, which feared the ebony and ivory pairing of Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder. Among his many honors, Poitier was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by Barack Obama, Sidney Poitier. Richard Pryor, because his comedy reflected America's racial pain and confusion. Richard Pryor, comedian, 1940 to 2005. Richard Pryor had a tough time growing up, including being abandoned by his mother. Searching for relief, he would often go to the movies. Little did he know that later he would be appearing in them. After a stint in the army, Pryor started singing in small clubs near his home in Peoria, Illinois, but he soon discovered that people would rather hear him tell jokes. He began performing in comedy clubs, and before too long, he was doing appearances in some of the biggest television shows of the time. Despite his success, he began to feel that his act wasn't authentic, and he changed it in a way that influenced every comedian that came after him. Pryor started to tell humorous but honest stories about himself and the poor and struggling people he knew from his childhood. He cursed a lot, just like real people do, and he wasn't afraid to make fun of white people. His comedy was full of the truth that black folks usually said in private. Pryor would talk about his problem with drugs and relationships. Later, when he suffered from multiple sclerosis, he would joke about that too. His comedy was rooted in pain, but audiences recognized the truth in it. Pryor started in two of his own television shows and a number of movies, including several comedies. Over the course of his career, he won an Emmy, Emmy five Grammys, and the first Mark Twain Prize for American Humor from the Kennedy Center, perhaps the biggest honor for a career in comedy, Richard Pryor. Jackie Robinson. On April 15th, 1947, Jackie Robinson played first base for the Brooklyn Dodgers in a home game against the Boston Braves. He was the first African-American to take the field in the big, big leagues in the modern era. And, not, and that day not only changed baseball, but helped change the country too. Robinson was a terrific player. The, that first year, he led the league in stolen bases and won the inaugural Rookie of the Year award. In his 10 years in the major leagues, he was named to all six all-star teams and led Brooklyn to its only World Series title in 1955. But he was even more rem a more remarkable man. Baseball was the most important sport in America at the time, and Robinson was chosen to integrate the game because he could handle the virulent racism from white players and white fans without losing his temper. Indeed, the, way, the best way to think of the importance of Robinson is to consider what would have happened if he failed. Segregation was the law against the South. In the North, a system of economic and cultural repression kept the races apart. If Robinson had quit or retaliated against all the hateful names and slights, his opponents would have used him as proof that African Americans were incapable of joining white society. Robinson's success created a path for African American achievements in other industries. Baseball integrated even before the military. After he left baseball, Robinson continued to work hard for black empowerment, writing for newspapers, and challenging presidents to advance the cause of civil rights. Robinson's courage and achievement at the time when Jim Crow laws deprived black citizens of basic human rights marked an important turning point in black history. 
Number 36, Sojourner Truth, Abolitionist Activist, 1797 to 1883, because of a famous speech amid a lifetime of activism. Sojourner Truth is most famous for words she may never have spoken. A traveling preacher who advocated for women's rights and abolition, Truth gave a speech at the Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio in 1851, calling for equal treatment for black women. Quote, that man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helped me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me any best place. And ain't I a woman? The message was powerful, but it's unlikely the words are exact. They come from a version published years after the event using a stereotypical Southern dialect. Truth, however, grew up in New York and Dutch was her first language. Regardless, Truth was famous. Her memoir, The Narrative of Sojourner Truth, A Northern Slave, was published in 1850, and she toured and spoke before large crowds. She was the ninth child in an enslaved family and escaped as an adult with her own infant daughter, born Isabella Bomfrey, she gave herself the name Sojourner Truth after becoming a Methodist. During the Civil War, she helped recruit black troops for the Union Army, which granted her the opportunity to speak with President Abraham Lincoln. Truth died in 1883 at her home in Battle Creek, Michigan. Four decades later, the constitutional amendment extending the vote to women was ratified. Sojourner Truth. Hi, I'm Miss Osborne Booth, and today I'll be reading a passage about Harriet Tubman from The Fierce 44, because she was a conductor on the Underground Railroad. Harriet Tubman was born into slavery and endured physical violence nearly every day in her early years. In one incident, Tubman encountered a slave who had left the fields without permission. When she refused to restrain the runaway, an overseer hurled a two pound weight at Tubman, striking her in the head. The attack left her with headaches and seizures for the rest of her life. Tubman escaped from slavery in 1849 using the Underground Railroad, a secret network of anti-slavery activists and safe houses to make the 90 mile trip from her home in Maryland to Philadelphia. But her own safety wasn't enough. Hearing that her niece and her niece's children were going to be sold, Tubman went back and led them to Philadelphia. Soon she returned for her siblings, then for her parents. After passage of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, which required that slaves who escaped to the North be seized and returned to slavery. Tubman changed her route, so it ended in Canada, where slavery was outlawed. Even though there was a bounty for her capture, she made at least 19 trips and led hundreds of people to freedom. During the Civil War, Tubman became a nurse and spy for the Union government she tended to the sick and wounded, caring for soldiers both black and white. After the war, Tubman was active in the women's suffrage movement and is now considered an American icon. Harriet Tubman. Hello everyone. The next person we're gonna learn about in the Fierce 44 is Madam C.J. Walker. Madam C.J. Walker was an entrepreneur and an activist, born in 1867 and passed away in 1919. Her real name was Sarah Breedlove. Sarah Breedlove, the poor washerwoman who would become millionaire entrepreneur Madam C.J. Walker, 
was trying to cure dandruff and banish her bald spots when she mixed her first batch of petrolatum and medicinal sulfur. But what began as a solution to a pesky personal problem quickly became a means to a greater end. With the sale of each two ounce tin of Madam C.J. Walker's wonderful hair grower, she discovered that her most powerful gift was motivating other women. As she traveled throughout the United States, the Caribbean, and Central America, teaching her Walker system and training sales agents, she shared her personal story. Her birth on the same plantation where her parents had been enslaved, her struggles as a young widow, her desperate poverty. If she could transform herself, so could they. In place of wash tubs and cotton fields, Walker offered women beauty, education, financial freedom, and confidence. The more money Walker made, the more generous she became, donating to her local black YMCA in Indianapolis and the NAACP's anti-lynching fund, establishing college scholarships and paying for lessons for young black musicians. In 1917, at the first national convention for her company, Walker awarded prizes to the women who sold the most products and recruited the most agents. More important, Walker honored the delegates who, whose local clubs had contributed the most to charity. Walker urged President Woodrow Wilson to support legislation that would make lynching a federal crime. She was labeled a Negro subversive by the War Department because of her advocacy for Black soldiers during World War I. A pioneer of today's multi-billion dollar hair care industry, Walker defied stereotypes, provided employment for thousands of women, and donated large sums to civic, educational, and political causes. And all of it started with hair ointment. Hi, I'm Miss Osborne Booth, and I will be reading a passage about Booker T. Washington from The Fierce 44, Black Americans Who Shook Up the World, because he brought education to the South. Booker T. Washington, educator, civil rights activist. Not long after the end of the Civil War, Booker T. Washington, who had been born into slavery, started Tuskegee Institute in 1881 with 30 students, $2,000, and a one-room shack. Southern whites saw an educated Negro as dangerous. So Washington told them that his students did not want equal rights. Instead, he said they wanted to learn trades such as carpentry and printing and contribute to Southern prosperity. Donations from Northern whites poured in and Tuskegee was allowed to grow. In 1895, Washington was the only black speaker to address a mostly white audience at an important meeting in Atlanta called the Cotton States, an international exposition. In his speech, which critics later called the Atlanta Compromise, Washington advised black men and women to work with their hands, stay in the South, and accept white supremacy in exchange for economic security. That speech helped make Washington the most influential black person in America at the time. He became an advisor to both President William McKinley and President Theodore Roosevelt on racial matters. Washington lectured around the country, helped start the National Negro Business League, and published a best-selling autobiography. While black intellectuals such as W.E.B. Du Bois chafed at the way he seemed to defer to whites, Washington used his influence 
to place African Americans in jobs across the country and secretly fund challenges to Jim Crow laws. When Washington died in 1915, the campus where he was buried had grown to 1,500 students and 100 buildings with a $2 million endowment. Booker T. Washington. Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells was a superhero of journalism. After three of her friends were murdered by a mob in Memphis, Tennessee in 1892, she started in to investigate the widespread horror of lynching. Wells faced down threats of death and torture for bringing international attention and shame to the whites who have terrorized black communities in the United States after Reconstruction. Just as many people could not believe the atrocities committed during World War II concentration camps, Wells encountered widespread denial and disbelief as she wrote about the barbaric acts of her countrymen in the pages of the Memphis Free Speech, the newspaper she co-owned. Documenting the epidemic of lynching was a miserable, disheartening work but Wells also found time to advocate for voting rights and civil rights of black women like herself. She wasn't much concerned with being polite about it either. For her troubles, she was criticized for being unladylike and dirty-minded. Yet, Wells represented the best of the American journalism. She dared America to confront its hypocrisies and live up to the ideals upon which the country was founded. Wells's crusade lives on today in those who document the killings of unarmed black police, people by police. She lives on in black women who not only exercise their right to vote, but also, like her, run for office. Wells ran for a seat in the Illinois State Senate. She lives on in the words and deeds of the NAACP, which she co-founded. No wonder Wells was known by the subtitle of her best known biography, A, S A Sword Among Lions. Hi, I'm Ms. Osborne Booth, and today I'll be reading a passage about Serena Williams from The Fierce 44, Black Americans Who Shook Up the World, because she's simply the best. Serena Williams tennis player. In any conversation about the greatest athletes, one name rises to the top, Serena Williams. She has enough victories for several lifetimes. She's won more Grand Slam singles titles than any other woman in the modern era. She's also won four Olympic gold medals. 14 Grand Slam doubles titles and a career Golden Slam singles titles from each of the sports four major events plus an Olympic gold medal in singles. Williams is the youngest of five daughters. Her father, a former sharecropper from Louisiana, learned from books and videos how to coach Serena and her older sister Venus. The Williams sisters had daily two-hour practices on a concrete court avoiding potholes and often practicing without nets. Growing up in Compton, California meant being a fighter and developing a tough skin which would characterize their game on and off the court. Williams transcended tennis, a historically white sport, by being herself. With incredible strength, dedication, and an energetic style of play. What makes Williams' career so remarkable is her spirit to rise above criticism of her appearance, game, and body, and still be the best year after year. 
whether she's serving tennis balls, designing affordable fashions, or teaming up with Beyonce in music videos, Williams' resume solidifies her place among sports all-time greats. Serena Williams. Number 42, August Wilson. Playwright, 1945 to 2005, because he is America's Shakespeare. Playwright August Wilson made it his life's work to document, explain, and validate the everyday lives of African Americans. Between 1984, when Ma Rainey's Black Bottom premiered, and 2005, when he died at age 60, Wilson produced what he called the American Century Cycle. It consisted of one play for every decade of the 20th century, a trajectory that went from the aftermath of slavery through the Great Migration and the Civil Rights Movement to the dawn of gentrification. Wilson's body of work stands as one of the greatest in the history of dramatic literature. He won two Pulitzer Prizes and multiple Tony and New York Drama Critics Circle Awards. Raised in Pittsburgh, Wilson set nearly all his work in his home neighborhood of the Hill District. Yet, it was only when he moved to the largely white St. Paul, Minnesota in his 30s that he began to fully hear and channel the spoken word poetry of the musicians, preachers, gamblers, jitney drivers, and sanitation workers among who he had lived. With the American Century Cycle, Wilson transmuted their voices into art for all ages. August Wilson. Hi, I'm Ms. Osborne Booth, and today I'll be reading a passage about Oprah Winfrey in The Fierce 44, Black Americans Who Shook Up the World, because she turned a talk show into a self-help movement. Oprah Winfrey, media mogul, philanthropist. When the Oprah Winfrey show started broadcasting nationally in 1986, it turned television, especially the daytime talk show, into something new. For starters, had she gotten into the television business only 10 years earlier, the Mississippi-born Winfrey wouldn't have been let anywhere near the set. She wasn't white, blonde, thin or male. Winfrey's superhero talent was getting people to really like her and to relate to her. The way she confessed her own weaknesses made self-help feel modern and chic. And she didn't inspire just black people. Women of all races eagerly joined her movement to live your best life, which is the title of one of her books. Winfrey used her position as host of one of the longest running daytime talk shows in television history to become a multimedia phenomenon. She's the owner of a cable TV network. She's a movie actress and a Broadway musical producer. She started a book club that made instant bestsellers. She's helped launch the careers of numerous television hosts and self-help gurus, including Dr. Phil, Ayala Van Zant, Dr. Oz, Susie Orman, Nate Burkus, Rachel Ray, Bob Green, and Gail King. Since the debut of O, the Oprah magazine, in April 2000, she's been on the cover of every issue, making her one of the most influential cover models in magazine publishing history. Her early endorsement of Barack Obama helped him win the Democratic Party nomination for president. She is the first African-American female billionaire. Her generosity, especially for educational endeavors, is legendary. Winfrey funded a girls-only private school in South Africa and scholarships for hundreds of students at Morehouse College. In 2011, she won an Academy Award 
for international humanitarian efforts. Ms. Oprah Winfrey. Hey everyone, we're up to the last person in the Fierce 44, and that last person is Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder was a singer, songwriter, and producer, as well as an activist, born in 1950. Since 1961, when the blind 11-year-old musical prodigy auditioned for Motown Records, Stevie Wonder has composed a full catalog of songs about love, compassion, justice, and unity. And his music still fills dance floors today. Born Stevelyn Judkins, he was given the name Stevie Wonder by Motown founder Barry Gordy. Wonder's first number one hit came in 1963 when he was only 13 with Fingertips Part 2, which referred to the song's bongo rhythms. In 2016, he released Faith with Ariana Grande. In between came dozens and dozens of timeless songs, melodies, and moments. No other musician has pulled so many heartstrings with the harmonica while simultaneously jamming so ferociously on the piano. Wonder wrote, produced, and played multiple instruments on the Spinner's 1970 hit, It's a Shame, and created his own hits, such as Sign, Seal, Delivered, I'm Yours, Superstition, Living for the City, and Sir Duke. All along, he has maintained an unrelenting social consciousness. Some stars flitted in and out of the struggle, but Wander remained, writing about the problems facing those on the bottom, like his song, You Haven't Done Nothing, a stinging rebuke of President Richard Nixon. His 1966 cover of Bob Dylan's Blowing in the Wind became an anthem of the civil rights movement, and his version of Happy Birthday helped persuade America to accept a holiday honoring Martin Luther King Jr. And as always, with wonder, Black love was nurturing and empowering, a continuous source of validation and strength. Half a century later, in an era when most Black music superstars dwell on earthly obsessions, wonder continues to elevate us to higher ground. And that, everyone, is the Fierce 44.